So even Warren Buffett says uh, the vast majority of people should index, and I agree with him. So are there any questions, or do I have any time? <laughs> uh, then again, you know, Warren Buffett doesn't index, and neither do I. So I thought I'd tell you why. And then maybe you'll have some more information to decide for yourself what makes, makes sense for you. You know, once a year in my class at Columbia, I, uh, at least for the last five, six years, somebody raises their hand and asked a question that goes something along the lines, uh, something like this. Hey, Joel, congratulations. You've been doing this for 35 years, uh, and you've had a nice record. But now there are more computers. There's more data. There's more ability to crunch numbers. And uh, kind of isn't the party over for us. Isn't it just a more hedge funds? There's, there's just a lot more competition. Isn't the party over for us? So my students are generally second year MBAs. I'd say average age 27 or so. Uh, so I just answer it this way. I tell them, let's go back to when you learn how to read. Uh, let's take a look at the most followed market in the world. That would be the United States. Let's take a look at the most followed stocks within the most followed market in the world. Those would be the S&P 500 stocks. Let's take a look at what's happened since you learned how to read. So I tell them from 1997, uh, when they were 9 or 10, uh, to 2000, the S&P 500 doubled. From 2000 to 2002, it halved. From 2002 to 2007, it doubled. From 2007 to 2009, it halved. And from 2009 to today, it's roughly tripled, which is my way of uh, telling them that people are still crazy. That was just the last 17 years. Uh, and I'm way understating the case, uh, because the S&P 500 is an average of 500 stocks. If you lift up the covers and look underneath what's going on, there's huge dispersion of those 500 stocks between those at any particular time that are in favor and those that are out of favor. And so there's a wild ride going underneath the covers. If you look under the covers, there's a wild ride of those 500 stocks at any particular time. And that doubling and halving, doubling and halving, with the average of 500 stocks, really smoothing the ride. So there should be uh, an opportunity. And uh, if you understand what stocks are, and I uh, guarantee my students' first day of class, uh, I make a guarantee every year they walk in, and I guarantee them this. If they do good valuation work I, uh, of a company, I guarantee them the market will agree with them. I just never tell them when. Could be a couple of weeks, could be two or three years, but if they do good valuation work, the market will agree with them. Stocks are not pieces of paper that uh, bounce up and down, and you put uh, complicated ratios on, like sharp ratios or Sertino ratios. Stocks are ownership shares of businesses that you are valuing, and if so inclined, tried to buy at a discount. So if you believe what Ben Graham said, that this horizontal line is fair value, and this wavy line around that horizontal line are stock prices, and you have a disciplined process to buy perhaps more than your fair share when they're below the line, and if so inclined, sell or short more than your fair share when they're above the line, the market is throwing us pitches all of the time. Uh, the reason people don't outperform the market, there are behavioral problems, there are agency problems, but it's not because we're not getting those uh, opportunities. Let me tell you how we value stocks. Uh, it's not very tough, and I think most of you will understand it. I think the best example that resonates, seems to resonate with most people, is uh, thinking about buying a house. And to keep the numbers simple, let's say that someone is asking a million dollars for the house. They want to sell. And your job is to figure out whether that's a good deal or not. So there's certain questions you would ask. First, one of the first questions I'd ask is, well, how much rent could I get for that thing? OK? So in other words, if I rented out that million dollar house, how much rent would I collect? If I uh, were going to collect 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars a year, seven, eight, nine percent yield on that house, that's one way I might go about valuing it. And what's the next question you would ask? I'm pretty sure I know what it would be. Uh, what are the other houses on the block going for, on the block next door, in the town next door? How does this compare? How relatively cheap is this relative to all my current choices? So that's what we do. We look at how relatively cheap is this business relative to other similar businesses, relative to a whole universe of choices that I have. We do that. We also go back in history, look at how this company or uh, this house has traditionally been valued versus other ones in the neighborhood or versus uh, other communities, and how is it being valued now. So measures of absolute and relative value. Absolutely cheap you know, on a rental basis, absolutely cheap, uh, or relatively cheap on all different kinds of measures that, that make sense to you. 
Now, we wouldn't use any of these measures all by themselves. If you just use relative cheapness, uh, if some of you remember the internet bubble and you bought the cheapest internet stock, that wasn't cheap. It was just cheap relative to all the other crazy priced uh, stocks at the time. But we use, as our, we use our measures of absolute relative values, checks and balances against each other to try to zero in on fair value. So when you do this, uh, this is actually a study we did of our valuation methodology, very, very similar to the way I just said we value uh, a house. This is how we, we looked at the 2,000 largest companies in the US over a 20-year period. This was 1992 to 2012. And we ranked them on a daily basis from 1 to 2,000 based on their discount to our assessment of value using these metrics. The x-axis here, you probably can't see it, uh, is just the valuation percentile. All this means is if you were in the bottom left-hand corner and you were in the first percentile, you're the 20 companies at any particular time out of those 2,000 that measure cheapest according to our measures of absolute and relative value. Uh, go to the 99th percentile, uh, you would be the 20 companies that measure most expensive out of those 2,000. The y-axis is uh, the year forward return on average during those 20 years. What this chart simply says is, on average, stocks that fell in our first percentile, the cheapest 20, uh, averaged a one-year forward return during those 20 years of 38%. Stocks that ranked in our second percentile averaged a one-year forward return of about 37%. And then we dropped down to this best fit line, which we always say we don't mind missing when we're making extra money. And then as we measure something more expensive, the year forward return drops. And if you were sitting in my class at Columbia, and I said, hey, does anyone see a long short strategy you might pursue if you could predict ahead of time which stocks would do best, second best, third best in order? And you did not say, I guess I'd buy these guys up here in the upper left hand corner and short these guys in the bottom right hand corner. If you didn't say that, I'd probably throw you out of class because it's very straightforward. That's what you should do. And by the way, that's what we do. The important thing to understand is that stocks are ownership shares of businesses, OK? Now, uh, by the way, that beautiful chart I showed you with the 90% fit, you know, why doesn't everyone do this? Uh, well, unfortunately, it doesn't look like that when you're living through that. That's an average over 20 years. If I showed you a snippet of three or four years, uh, the fit would be nice. It might be 0 0.55, 0 0.6, something like that. But uh, it's uh, not going to be very cooperative, right? If what we did worked every day and every month and every year, uh, everyone would do it. It would stop working. But, but it, uh, it, it doesn't, unfortunately. Uh, but the reason that we stick to what we're doing even when it's not working is that chart. Meaning the way we value companies, our measures of absolute and relative value, are approximately how the market values them over time. But if you view stocks as ownership shares of businesses that you value and try to buy at a discount, and that doesn't work for a couple of years, I'm not going to change what I'm doing. I'm not going to buy the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you know, buy all the money losers and the companies uh, that don't earn anything or trading it 100 times free cash flow. I'm not going to buy those even if it works in one particular year and then sell the ones that uh, are cheap relative to everything, get me high rents and everything else. I'm not, I'm not going to change my strategy. Uh, and I believe that uh, stocks will eventually, not right now, but eventually uh, people will get it right, and I may have to be patient. That's really what I have to do. What that chart tells me is I'm on the right track, meaning that's sort of our true north, and we just have to be patient to get there. Uh, the reason that these simple metrics don't get arbitraged away is the example I uh, usually use for arbitrage is, uh, oh, you see gold in New York at $1,200, and, uh, and it's selling at London simultaneously at 1201 well, an arbitrageur sitting on a trading desk someplace will see that and buy up gold in New York at 1200 and push the price up a little bit. He'll simultaneously sell gold in London at 1201 push the price down. And they'll convert someone uh, somewhere in the middle. And it'll happen so fast on a trading desk that you don't really even get to see that. But what if I told you you could buy gold in New York today at 1200 and sometime in the next two, three years, you're going to make money, but you could lose 20% of your money while you're waiting. There's no guy sitting on a desk anywhere that really uh, can do that. And, in, and frankly, uh, time horizons are getting shorter. Uh, it used to be, when I was uh, younger, I used to get quarterly statements, and most people would throw them in the garbage. Now you can check your stock price 30 times a minute on the internet. Maybe some of you do. Uh, and time horizons are shrinking. And we're just playing time arbitrage. We're being uh, patient, buying cheap, good businesses, and waiting for the market to recognize the value we see. But it takes some work to value companies. And let's say you don't want to do that. You know, you have a day job. I guess everyone here has a day job. So you don't want to do that. So one thing you could do is try to find someone good to do it for you, right? I'm showing you there's this opportunity. Maybe someone can do it for you. 
And what you should probably look for when you're looking for that person is someone who has a good investment process. OK? That makes sense to you. The problem is, uh, for most active managers, uh, if you think of their challenge, when they're picking an individual stock, they must think that they have a variant uh, hypothesis as to why that stock is priced differently than the way it should be. And I can tell you I've been doing this over 35 years, and it's very rare, almost never, have I bottom ticked a stock, bought, bought it at the absolute bottom. So 99.9 plus percent of the time, a stock is down after I bought it. And there are really only two reasons why. One is I was wrong. The other is I just need more time for my thesis to play out. OK? Now, as an outside allocator, you don't really know what the thesis for the individual stock was. Even the allocator himself, the manager, I mean, I'm sorry, the manager himself sometimes doesn't know. When things are going against you, there are all kinds of agency problems. You know, you've got people to answer to. You have behavioral issues, just naturally you start to doubt yourself. It's very unclear sometimes even to them what their biases are and what they're doing. So the allocator doesn't really understand the thesis behind each pick. It's not clear that the manager uh, is totally unbiased when he has a variant thesis that's going against him. Um, and so since you don't need, know the thesis as an allocator, most people, uh, all they have are the returns. And that's what they used. I wrote a book. Uh, I hold it up here. Uh, it's called The Big Secret. And I always say it's still a big secret because uh, no one read it. <laughs> uh, and in that book, um, I talked about a few studies. Number one, uh, it talked about the best performing uh, manager. I wrote it in 2011. So it talked about the decade 2000 to 2010. Looked at the best performing mutual fund, a study of the best performing mutual fund for that decade. Uh, that fund was up 18% per year, 100% long the US equities. The market was flat during those 10 years. So 18% up a year is pretty good. Unfortunately, the average investor in that fund on a dollar weighted basis managed to lose 11% a year. Because every time the, fund, uh, the market went up, people piled in. When the market went down, they piled out. When the fund outperformed, they piled in. When the fund underperformed, they piled out. And they took an 18% annual gain and turned it into an 11% annual dollar weighted loss. Why? Well, to beat the market, if you're beating by 18 points, you're doing something different than the market. You're going to zig and zag differently. You can't do the same as the market. You have to do something different. You're going to zig and zag differently. Uh, institutional managers are no different. Here are the stats on the, uh, if you just took a look at the top institutional managers for that decade, the ones who, 2000 to 2010, the top quartile managers, the ones who ended up with the best 10-year record, here are the stats on them. 97% of those who ended up with the best 10-year record, top quartile, spent at least three of the 10 years in the bottom half of performance. Not shocking, but everyone, right? To beat the market, you have to do something different. You're going to zig and zag differently. 79% of those who ended up with the best 10-year record spent at least three of the 10 years in the bottom quartile performance. And here's the stunner. 47%, roughly half, of those who they ended up with the best record, but they spent at least three of those 10 years in the bottom decile, the bottom 10% of performers. So you know no one stayed with them. But they ended up with the best record. So it's very hard, uh, very hard to pick an allocator because you don't know the thesis, so you're using past returns. But when you do that, all you're doing is chasing your tail, going in and out at all the wrong times. Uh, so it's, it's very hard. Uh, what a good allocator, usually an institutional allocator, and there are a few of them, should be looking at process and do you stay with your process. So one thing you can do is do it yourself. I wrote a book, uh, Sarab mentioned, called You Can Be a Stock Market Genius, World's Worst Title of All Time. But in it, it said sort of what Warren Buffett calls, why don't we look for one-foot hurdles, OK? And I opened the book with a story about my in-laws uh, who uh, used to spend, uh, they, they had a house in Connecticut, and they used to spend the weekends going to yard sales and country auctions uh, looking for bargains. OK, paintings or sculptures, they, they were uh, art collectors. And they were not going to these yard sales and country auctions looking for, to, uh, you know, seeing a painting that was discarded, saying, this guy's the next Picasso. 
That's not what they were doing. What they were looking for are uh, pieces of art or sculpture that they uh, know uh, the artist. Some of his similar work had just gone for auction for a lot more than they could buy it for, right? They can buy it for 30 or 40 cents on the dollar of what it just went to auction for. That's a lot different question. And so what the, you can be a stock market genius was, was showing you these areas that are ignored. These are the country auctions and the yard sales of the investment world. And these were, uh, you know, I talked about different areas, spin-offs, bankruptcies, uh, um, you know, uh, small cap stocks, uh, you know, uh, companies going through recapitalizations, anything weird, complicated situations. Uh, so that's another way, but you guys have a full-time job. That is a full-time job. Let me tell you that's a full-time job. Basically, the best strategy for you, which is how I'll end before I take questions, is not only one that makes sense, but one you can stick with. Okay? So you have to understand what you're doing, number one. If you give it to someone else, you have to understand what they're doing. And you have to be able to stick with it. So you have to understand it well enough to stick with it.